Thank you, everyone, for being early birds. A lot of our guests are here from the East Coast, so I think we're helping their body clocks a little bit in, uh, in Karen's case, and in my next case with Sally Bedell Smith uh, talking about the future of the monarchy. But I think with, with YouTube and with the imminence of social media, we get so used to thinking that we know the people whose faces are so familiar to us. Uh, and yet, even some of the people who are household names, as Nancy Reagan certainly was, uh, you find that there are things that we don't know. And particularly with Nancy Reagan, she had a movie career at a time when the movie people made up biographies wholesale for people. Um, she lived a very public life as a very private person, and in some cases um, made it clear that this was a no-go zone, that people were not going to find out things about her that she didn't want to be known. And that's where Karen Tumulty <laughs> comes in, to bring, us, to bring us more about Nancy Reagan um, and a better understanding of her, that period in our country's history, and of course her husband's administration. Uh, and, and so let's take off on that point, because I think of, of her as a known public figure, and yet you found so much more about her, good and bad, that we had no clue at the time. Uh, that's right. And she was just, uh, first of all, thank you, everyone, for being here, and especially for being here so early. Uh, I've, I've been looking forward to this for so long. Um, so this book was not my idea. Simon & Schuster uh, came to me in the fall of 2016, and Nancy Reagan had just died, and they said, we're interested in a biography of her. Do you want to write it? I I'm a political reporter, and I'm such a good political reporter that in the fall of 2016, I told myself, well, Hillary Clinton's going to be such a conventional president, I'm going to need an outside project. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. Um, and I, but as I approached it, you know, that meant I went into this with no outline, no really preconceptions or anything, and I'd never written a book before. So I soon found out that I was way underwater on this. Um, and so much had been written about the Reagans. So I was one night in having my insom my what the heck did I get myself into insomnia, and I'm digging through a book by Lou Cannon, a big, gigantic Reagan biography. And he has this one line in the book where he says of Reagan, he says, Reagan always knew where he wanted to go, but she had a better idea what it was going to take to get there. And I thought, that is the book I want to write. Um, so I, you know, the thing about Nancy Reagan was she was just so complex. And as I would dig and dig, and each layer was just 10 more layers underneath it. But I realized if I could pull this off, it was going to be a book not just about a woman and a marriage, but really about an entire era in our history. And one thing you realize about Nancy Reagan is she, he really couldn't have done it without her, that the two of them were so closely bound that, and they really compensated, f they, they enhanced each other's strengths, they compensated for each other's weaknesses. Uh, Ronald Reagan, for as affable as he was, as you know, he had this amazing ability to connect with the country at large, he was personally a very remote figure. Um, he, you know, he, Really, I, didn't, I explore this a lot in the book because he was the adult child of an alcoholic. And it was, in some ways, a coping mechanism. And she was the one who really had the radar about people. And he was very conflict-averse. You know, she would cross the street to get into a fight. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I, I, as I was exploring this, and the other thing that I found really interesting about her was how, you know, t rough of a go she really had it as First Lady. She was very controversial, and I was just, at very early in the book, I make a list of the nicknames that she was called at various points. The Iron Butterfly, the Bell of Rodeo Drive, Fancy Nancy, the Cutout Doll, Evita, Mommy Dearest, the Hairdo with Anxiety, and my my favorite, Attila the Hen. 
So, um, but it, that, she was the person Ronald Reagan needed. She, he needed the enforcer. She, um, in the West Wing, she rarely set foot there, but if she was unhappy about something, they all knew it. Mm. She's one of the reasons he went through six national security advisors. So again, it was this partnership I really do think, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan wouldn't have been Ronald Reagan without Nancy Reagan. And what came through in the book was how much her anxieties drove her. She was, her, her father abandoned her young. She was anxious about money. She was anxious about security. She was anxious about her career, about love. I mean, she essentially stalked Ronald Reagan until he married her. She did. Um, so, but how did all that play out in being the governor's wife, eight years as governor, wife to the governor of California, eight years as first lady? But she was, and she was, um, her father left very shortly after she was born. Her mother abandoned her for seven years with relatives. And so she really had this sense, she carried, and their son Ron really was very eloquent in describing this. I mean, she always had this sense that no matter how much success they had, no matter how good things were, no matter how much security they had found together, because Ronald Reagan had also had a very difficult life before Nancy, that the bottom could drop out at any minute. And, you know, certainly that seemed to almost be confirmed uh, three hundred days into his presidency when he is almost felled by an assassin's bullet. Uh, he came much closer to dying than they let the country know at the time. And um, so she, you know, he would never leave the house without her being afraid that, you know, someone else, she would obsess on things like the fact that presidents who are elected in years that end in zero tend to get a die in office. Or, and, and so she was just always convinced that there was always someone out there who was going to finish off what John Hinckley started. So she didn't want him to run for re-election. Um, you mentioned the superstition. I guess it's the moment to jump in with the astrologer. One, there, if anybody knows a story about Nancy Reagan, it's probably Joan Quigley, the astrologer, whom she consulted and whose advice she used occasionally to guide Ronald Reagan's political schedule as well. Was it as big an influence or occasional, or how would you fit it into her narrative? Well, first of all, um, astrology was a big, big thing with Hollywood people in the 40s and 50s. And when you think about it, show business is kind of a superstitious profession. I mean, people talk about getting your lucky break or, you know, show people you can't whistle in the dressing room. You can't have your shoes higher than your head. You can't say Macbeth. Right, exactly. So it was kind of, you know, Ronald Reagan would go to astrology parties with Jane Wyman, too. But the thing about Nancy Reagan, it became an obsession with her after the assassination attempt. Uh, Nancy Reagan was not a religious person. Uh, her father, who she adored, her adoptive father, uh, was actually an atheist. Um, that was sort of how she was brought up. Ronald Reagan believed that he was spared from that because God had a plan for him. And that really brought him a lot of peace. But for her, she was, as I said, always convinced that something horrible was going to happen. And believe it or not, they didn't have metal detectors at the White House before the assassination attempt. Mm. And finally, they put them in, and the Secret Service is horrified to discover that every year, hundreds of tourists were coming into the White House carrying guns. Um, so she, she would grab onto astrology just because it kind of gave her a sense of control. She would, every Sunday, when they, they were, they used to Camp David more than any other couple before or since, and she would sit there on the phone with Joan Quigley, and they'd go over the schedule, and, jo you know, Quigley would give her, you know, oh, this has to happen at exactly this time. So if Reagan was going off to an overseas summit and the, the press corps is wondering why the plane is taking off at 2 in the morning, uh, the White House press office would make up a story like, well, you know, the doctor tells us this is good for dealing with jet lag. But in fact, it was Joan Quigley 
who would determine, you know, literally presidential movements. And if you think about that, that is about the least secure thing you could imagine. <laughs> Think of what Putin would do with that nowadays. And there, oh. and there is this woman out in San Francisco who Nancy Reagan has only met in person a couple of times, determining the movements of the you know, leader of the free world. And this goes back to California where he was sworn in in the middle of the night as governor because that's when that was the propitious time. They, well, that, you know, Lou Cannon says also that uh, Pat Brown was making a lot of appointments, like judicial appointments. The previous appointments. governor, uh, yeah. The, Pat Brown, the previous, Jerry Brown's father. It's funny, Reagan defeated Jerry Brown's father and then was succeeded by Jerry Brown. Um, but so another, they did have another reason, which they wanted to start his administration the first minute they could because Brown was making a lot of appointments oh. on the way out. But I think the astrology thing, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll buy that one too. Um, she was so attuned to her husband's image and so defensive of it, but she was so tone deaf about her own. I mean, when the administration was cutting food to poor kids, she was getting the free White House China. She would get freebies when the country was in, in recession. How could someone from Hollywood who knew the importance of image be so clueless about her own? Well, she was from Hollywood where you got free stuff all the time. Um, but she, I, as I write in the book, um, if, if he was the Teflon president, she was the Velcro first lady. <laughs> um, and so she would do these kind, and, and again, she was, she was almost flawless in her decisions of who around her husband needed to go and when and what he needed to do for his image and that sort of thing. But she would just make these mistakes over and over and over again. She would publicly, uh, you know, when the people found out she was getting free designer clothes, again, something typical in Hollywood, uh, she would swear off of it and then people around her would start noticing these clothes coming back. And um, the White House counsel at the time was a guy named Fred Fielding. And he told me that he used to send lawyers from the White House counsel's office through the presidential residence like once or twice a year, just looking for stuff that looked like it was freebies, like these picture frames from Frank Sinatra or these, you know, it was, uh, again, it was, it was something that again and again and again would get her in trouble, but she just didn't seem to learn from it. Um. To talk about their relationship, first of all, in the limited sense of her input on his policy decisions. Um, she steered him clear of a lot of right-wing hardliner stuff. Um, she once said, I don't give a damn about right to lifers, but sometimes she would push him too hard and he would finally say, I heard you the first time, I heard you the second time, I heard you the third time. How did that political dynamic work when she was saying, this is good for you, this is what you need to do, and he's like, enough? Yeah, people don't think of Nancy Reagan as having had much of an effect on policy, but she did. And not in the because she herself was an ideologue, but because she really had a sense of her husband. And again, he, Ronald Reagan was close to exactly one person in the world, and he married her. Um, so I opened the book with this remarkable story. One of her obsessions was that she wanted her husband to go down in history as a peacemaker. In fact, she had hoped he would win the Nobel Peace Prize because she, she and it turns out Gorbachev wins it without him, but um, she, had, she knew that like the liberal intelligentsia on the East Coast sort of saw Ronald Reagan as this, you know, cowboy kept shooting from the West. And she knew he was really much more complicated than that. He'd and been a Democrat and he'd been a labor union leader. And yes, he was a hardline anti-communist, but he was also an idealist who believed in the biblical prophecy of Armageddon. And he was anxious to try to, you know, foster peace. So George Shultz, who was became Secretary of State in the for a year and a half into the Reagan administration, replacing Al Haig, who was a disaster and who Nancy helped dispatch. Um, he doesn't really know 
Ronald Reagan all that well. Um, and all, what he knows is that Ronald Reagan has hardline anti-communist rhetoric and, and that he's surrounded by hardliners like Casper Weinberger, the defense secretary, and his national security advisor. And, and these are all people who think that there could never be anything like a working relationship with the Soviet Union. So George Shultz is coming back from an overseas trip. Washington gets socked in by a blizzard. And as the city is starting to dig out, Nancy Reagan calls up George Shultz and says, why don't you and your wife come over to dinner tonight? It'll just be the four of us. So Shultz gets over there. He told me this story. He was 97. And he's surprised that both of the Reagans start pounding him with questions because he has just gotten back from China. What are they like? You know, do they have a bottom line? Do they have a sense of humor? And then they move on to talking about the Soviet Union. And Reagan starts describing, Reagan, who thinks he's a pretty good negotiator, he was the head of the Screen Actors Guild, starts talking about how badly he wants to find himself across a table with the head of the Soviet Union. Uh, they go through four of them before they get to Gorbachev. They kept dying on him. And um, <laughs> suddenly, Schultz told me that this, it suddenly occurs to him why this dinner is happening. Because Nancy Reagan, this wasn't a social dinner. She wanted to get this new Secretary of State away from all these hardline advisors so that he could hear directly from Ronald Reagan and really understand things about her husband that nobody else did. And Schultz said, I also figured out something else that night. I figured out anybody with brains would make a friend of the first lady. <laughs> so, um, you know, it is after that. Although she would still, um, the Reagans were, they were a real married couple. I mean, they would have gigantic arguments. She was furious at him when he used the phrase evil empire to describe the Soviet Union. And Stu Spencer, I don't know if any of, he lives right around here. He was Reagan's first top, he was political advisor, told me he was at dinner with them one night. And Nancy is still just railing at him about this evil empire thing. And Reagan's getting really tired of this. So finally, um, he says to Stu, he says, well, Stu, what do you think? about evil empire. And Stu's trying to be diplomatic and he goes, well, Mr. President, you know, yeah, they are kind of evil, but that was kind of a tough thing to say. And at that point, Reagan just cuts him off like, because he's giving Nancy ammo. And it's like, what's for dessert? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, the, his allergy to this interpersonal conflict, as you talk about it, that ma made her change how she dealt with her job in the White House. You've described to some degree. Um, but, but their own marriage, before we get into some of the family stuff, how singular it was to be such an enclosed unit, of it, and to the exclusion even of their own children, the consequences of which we will get yes. into. Um, but did, did anybody ever get to the point of understanding the nature of that marriage in terms of them dealing with it on a practical level, whether it was in the White House, the governor's office, um, or even among their own friends. And, and the Reagans used to come here to the Annenbergs every New Year's for years and years. So they had a circle of friends, but still you sense that gulf. Yeah, she was the one who really cultivated the circle of friends. Um, Ron Reagan described it to me as his mother arranging play dates for his father. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and she really under, you know, it, she was the one. He, he really would rather be off at the ranch. But they were such a closed relationship. And people at the White House who were smart began to understand that. James Baker, who was the first White House chief of staff, didn't really know the Reagans that well. Uh, Ed Meese had expected to become chief of staff. And... He told me it was only because of Nancy that he was picked. He barely, like I said, he was a Bush guy. He barely knew them. But he told me, you know, if you could get her on board an idea, you had a pretty good chance of getting him on board of it. 
And the other thing that was true in this White House, and this became true with a lot of the, the ideologues who she didn't trust at all, it, if you were on her bad side, you didn't tend to last very long around there. You know, first ladies usually are more popular than their husbands as you poll throughout their presidencies. This was the opposite. Was she willing to fall on her sword, but didn't like the fact that she was doing so and was, was taking the hits for it? She, uh, you know, if, if something needed to be done in his interest, she was ready to do it. You know, she, again, it, this also goes back to the anxiety. You know, anything that was threatening them, threatening him, she would take care of. But ultimately, no, she did not like the criticism. It, it stung. Um, and it's funny, too, because after the biggest crisis to beset his, um, his presidency is the Iran-Contra scandal. I mean, he came, he was in danger of getting impeached over that. And I have one of the chapters I'm proudest of in the book is how crucial she was. She was essentially the one-woman rescue operation in that White House. But all of a sudden, you see her image go from being Nancy Reagan, vapid, dilettante, social life, fashionista, to Nancy Reagan, she's like Edith Wilson, she's really running the country. So she went all the way from, you know, being seen as a, a fluff in the White House to... To Lady Macbeth. Yes. <laughs> oh, I said that again, damn it. Um, and I don't think she ever got used to it. No, no, but it, um, the country then has a completely another reassessment of her, which is late in his life when he, when he develops Alzheimer's. It, you know, most presidents live and thrive for a long time after they're out of office, and they get to use that time to kind of reshape, to begin to write the first draft of their legacy. Ronald Reagan didn't get that. He was incapacitated so soon after he was out of office. So it really falls on Nancy Reagan to, to both build and to protect the legacy. You know, you see it in kind of physical ways. I mean, setting up the library, making sure it's got the funding, but in other things too. She was absolutely, again, wanted people to understand her husband for the fullness of who he was. So she decides to get his diaries published so that people can sort of see him in his own, um, you know, in his own words, that she publishes 50 years worth of letters he wrote everybody from the woman who ran his Hollywood fan club in Pennsylvania. For 50 years he wrote her uh, to world leaders. She um, has makes sure that his speeches in his own hand get published. But the other thing she does is she was suspicious of people because he was such an icon to the conservative movement. She became very suspicious of people who would invoke Ronald Reagan for their own reasons. And she was very protective of that. She, for instance, um, after the Republicans took over the House in 1994, the Gingrich Republicans, there was a move, there was a bill introduced in Congress to take FDR off the dime and put Ronald Reagan on the dime. And Nancy Reagan stands up and says, my husband worshiped FDR. He would not approve of this. I mean, she was able to sort of shut down people who would sort of invoke him to do something that was really just what they wanted to do. There are two parts of her personal life I want to get to. The drugs we'll get to secondly. But the first one is the this was a family values administration that at its heart was terrible with family values because their own family, their uh, their kids were peripheral to, to who they were as a marriage. And she admitted as much that she was a better wife than mother. But the part, there's one moment that made me gasp and that was she's asking her stepdaughter's husband who's in the military about whether Ron and Jane Wyman's adopted son could be drafted and sent to Vietnam. She, well, she also, well, the one thing I thought, well, Michael was, uh, first of all, each of, the four Reagan children. There were two from the Wyman marriage um, and two that they had of their own. Uh, Ron, the youngest, who does the atheist dads now, um, he, he was actually sort of the apple of their eye to the degree there was one. But here's something else. Michael, 
when he was getting married for the first time in Hawaii, the Reagans were in Washington at Tricia Nixon's wedding. And then didn't, this may have been an Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's function about recognizing Michael at the, Well, no, this was not, so I also spend a lot of time exploring Alzheimer's and, you know, with Reagan, it's very hard to figure out I mean, obviously, Alzheimer's develops over a long time. There are organic processes going on. But it, to the degree he was incapacitated, people would say, oh, he must have had it in the White House because he would get names mixed up, things like that. Well, back in the 60s, he was the speaker at his own son Michael's high school graduation. And as he's going through the line, introducing himself to the graduates, he turns to, hi, I'm Ronald Reagan, hi, I'm Ronald Reagan, hi, I'm Ronald Reagan, and he gets to Michael, and Michael takes off his mortarboard and goes, Dad, I'm your son. <laughs> so. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry at that one, actually. <laughs> so, uh, But let's talk a little bit about the drug use. Nancy is famous for her Just Say No campaign, which was about illegal drugs, but now we know from fentanyl and other problems the risks of prescription drugs, uh, abused, overused, etc. And and in this, she was a product of her time. That's right. Um, the, she, she, it, there was a time when, you know, if a woman went to a doctor with a problem, he didn't want to hear about her problem. He would just hand her some drugs. And, in fact, they called this group of women, you know, the housewives of the 50, they called them the Milltown generation. It was a drug that was doctors used to give women like candy. Well, Nancy Reagan developed what I was ultimately convinced was a fairly serious prescription drug problem. Uh, diet pills during the day, which are really amphetamines at night, pills to sleep. And in the White House, even as she was going around and, you know, the, her Just Say No campaign, um, which was aimed at small children, and I actually think was a lot more successful than people are willing to give it credit for now. But even as she's doing this, not one but two White House physicians were concerned enough about her uh, her own drug use to be, you know, one went to the president and said, and Reagan didn't want to hear it, and the second one tried to get her off of some of this, and she, um, you know, she had such a violent withdrawal reaction that they ended up having to put her back on it, and then. Again, Edmund Morris, who was, wrote a big biography of Reagan that was very controversial, but he gave me some pages out of his own diary of an instance where he saw her take, in the middle of the day, a halcyon. I don't know if you guys remember. It was a very strong sleeping pill. It was banned in England. Um, and, you know, he, he saw her have this, this episode, which, again, he describes in great detail in his diary, and I describe in great detail in the book. Um, and, you know, this was the one, I thought this was, of everything in the book, that this was going to be the thing that was the most sensitive with Reagan world. So I made sure it's very documented, and uh, they have not challenged it. And there's a poignant moment where Patty Reagan asks her father about why her mother takes so many drugs. Yeah, it's, this is when he's traveling a lot, and she says, why does mom take so many drugs? And he says, because of you. <laughs> so, Imagine laying that on your kid. I mean, that was really, I mean, not to use the, the term, but a sobering moment. And well, it's interesting. It's um, and, I, I, you know, each of the Reagan children end up sort of going their own way and dealing with the you know, the legacy, the burdens of being uh, in their own way. Um, I don't mean to sound elitist about this, but I was surprised, for instance, to find out that four Reagan children, not one of them graduated from college. Mm. Um, and Maureen, for instance, the oldest, goes off, marries a Washington, D.C. policeman who is abusing her, uh, she never tells her parents this. I mean, she finally leaves him when he takes her kitten and throws it against the wall. Um, but she's, you know, she, she's hiding all of this from her own parents. You, you'd think that Nancy Reagan is such a known known to spin on the phrase from Rumsfeld, but there were many things that you found out, pieces of information 
research documents, letters that had not come to light before. Won't you talk about those? Yeah, I, um, there's, uh, her whole life is just so interesting. I mean, the Hollywood years, to me, I found completely fascinating. But when you do research at a presidential library, there's a stu and we all know a lot more about what the National Archives does with presidential documents than we did a few <laughs> months ago. But, but the official stuff they have to show you, the personal stuff they don't have, uh, they give those to the family. So it took me a couple of years to get enough trust from them that they would start showing me the good stuff. Although I never got the letters with Prince Charles, which I was begging for, but anyway. So at, they, at one point, bring me the- Don't worry, Harry will tell you right, all about that. exactly. <laughs> but, so they bring out this big box of stuff, and it's personal stuff from the last residence in Bel Air. And I start looking, and it's clear to me that these have been stuck in this box, but nobody's really looked at what's there, because it's so many, and they were things that obviously meant a lot to her. But I find this letter. It is a four-page handwritten letter by Ronald Reagan on White House stationery. Not a word crossed out. And it is, he wrote it three weeks before Nancy's father died. So he was on his deathbed. And as I said, he was an atheist. And Ronald Reagan, on four pages, begs his father-in-law to accept God before he dies. And in these four pages are just the most perfect distillation of Reagan's own religious faith. So I did go back to the library and I said, look, this can't wait for the book. I'm a columnist for the Post. I, I need to write this. But you also find out that my single favorite bit of trivia in the book, and it's only a subordinate clause in all this fat book, <laughs> is that I, I trace her how she got to Hollywood and how she gets signed by MGM, the most, you know, the biggest studio, signs this, you know, she was attractive, but, you know, she wasn't Elizabeth Taylor or, you know, Rita Hayworth or the kind of people who were wandering around the MGM lot at the time. And it turns out Spencer Tracy was a friend of her family growing up, and her mother had been an actress, and he had a secret, which was that he was a violent alcoholic. And when he needed to dry out, he would go to Chicago. Nancy's neurosurgeon father would get him a private floor. He would dry out, then he would stay with the Davis family, and then he'd go on his way. So when Nancy's looking for her big break, Spencer Tracy sets up this screen test. And normally, if you get a screen test, they'd grab whatever technicians were on the lot. No, they bring in George Cukor, like the biggest director in Hollywood, to direct her screen test. And she's, so sh she does adequately to get a two-year contract from Hollywood. But my favorite bit of trivia that I found out was that because MGM signed Nancy Davis in 1949, they decided to take a pass on another actress which is how they lost Marilyn Monroe, which has to have been the worst decision ever made by any Hollywood studio. Um, you, you mentioned George Cukor, who was known as a woman's director, but Nancy was not a woman's woman, really, for all her circle of friends. She was a man's woman, don't you think? Is that fair? Um, or at least one man's, we know that. Well, definitely one man's. Uh, she was, I mean, she did have very, very close friends, and she could be a very, very loyal friend. But Ron and other people would tell me she was, you know, especially a lot of the, you know, women who worked in a working environment, she could be a very difficult boss. And Ron always told me, he said, I always thought my mom was a little harder on the women than the men. Oh. Um, did you come away liking her? or thinking differently about her, at least? I don't think I would have wanted to work for her, but um, I do think that I, I found a lot to admire in her, and I do think she was way, way, way overdue for a reassessment. And I think that her, um, you know, her importance in history had just never 
really been understood. And let's face it, every first lady, I mean, this is no job description. You know, it's a title, but not a, not a role. And so every single one of these women, and they've all been women so far, uh, have had to sort of figure it out for themselves. And in her case, she just had such a flawless sense of what her husband needed to succeed. Uh, how did she deal with, because there's so few women who've done this before, what were her relations with other first ladies? Oh, oh, some of the juiciest stuff in the book is about... <laughs> now we're getting to it. Um, she and Barbara Bush just hated each other. And um, there's, yeah, well, it was, um, it, it was bad enough. That, I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, so the biggest, biggest, biggest social event of all the Reagan years, they, they had more state dinners than anybody else ever had, was when Prince Charles and Princess Diana come to town. And um, so the guest list gets made up for this state dinner and she crosses off the bushes. And Michael Deaver goes, uh, you know, you cannot not invite the vice president to this thing. <laughs> to which she says, watch me. <laughs> so, but I mean, the thing about Barbara oh. Bush is she could give it as well as take it. So Lou Cannon, who was the Washington Post reporter, great Reagan biographer, told me that he was on Air Force Two once as Bush was beginning, H.W. was beginning to run for president. <clears throat> and Barbara Bush comes to the back of the plane, which is where all the reporters sit. And she starts doing these vicious impersonations of Nancy Reagan. And finally, Lou Cannon says to her, he says, you know, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Reagan has spies all over the place. This is going to get back to her to which Barbara Bush turns to Lou Cannon and says, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is juicy. As I was reading your book, I thought not only does this demand a reassessment of Nancy Reagan, but it will really help recalibrate how people perceive Ronald Reagan as well. Have you already been hearing some of that and seeing some of the, uh, the ripple effect? You know, I have been most gratified by how many people who were close to them have come to me and really um, have told me that how much they, they love the book. In fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had lunch with, there's a fellow who was Reagan's executive assistant, which means he was in the room for everything. He was sort of a young kid at the time. He would go with them every week to Camp David, he would, um, they would have their fights in front of him. And, um, you know, I, I had lunch with him just, again just a couple of weeks ago because he had, I had first interviewed him and it was a perfectly fine interview, a couple of hours long. And then about three or four weeks later, he calls me up and he says, we need to talk again. And he said, and bring your tape recorder. And it turns out the guy has a photographic memory and he had all these wonderful stories that had never come out before. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. What I'll need you to do is when I call on you, if you stand up and say your question, I need to repeat it up here for the recording equipment. So as you've been listening, I'm sure something has occurred to you. Yes, please, let me hear you and I will repeat it. So let me, uh, let me repeat it. So this is about the relationship between the Reagans and Tip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House, another Irishman, but a Democrat. Uh, that's right. And, you know, uh, both, you know, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill both understood that you could disagree very much on policy, but that just didn't, didn't mean you had to hate each other. So, yes, I mean, Right. Well, so, and t Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan were two old Irishmen who could get together over drinks and, you know, and not hate each other. The other thing that I think is really missing in today's politics is politicians who are able to decide that a compromise is a win. Um, and I got to Washington in the 80s, and I remember, I mean, as much as, you know, people 
they were able to negotiate immigration legislation. They were able to re negotiate massive tax reform uh, because everybody knew that at the end of the day, the voters were going to reward you for getting things done. And now I do think that the the real difference in Washington now is that people come and they believe their voters are going to reward them at home for stopping things. Mm. So Ronald Reagan would not be president today, nor would Tip O'Neill be speaker in all likelihood. Oh, I just, uh, you know, you look at some of Reagan's positions and I don't think that he'd be, you know, he might be drummed out of the party. Mm. I mean, he did do the biggest immigration bill, a gigantic amnesty. Uh, in fact, he liked the word amnesty. Another question, yes, would you stand up please? Okay. The question is about Alzheimer's and to use the lovely phrase, the long, long goodbye, uh, and how she came to cope with that and to deal with that and s really set an example for the nation. She, um, and she would say, you know, I had always thought our golden years be the two of us sitting there sharing memories. And she was deprived of that. By the late 1990s, he was you know, barely able to, um, you know, have a conversation with her, much less sit there and share memories. The other thing that became extremely important to her was protecting his dignity. Um, she, you know, she was very, very careful about who was allowed to be near him. She became very, very worried about money at that point. Um, I mean, the Reagans were certainly comfortable, but you know, his high earning years in Hollywood were decades in the past. And what she was terrified about, even as he is getting sort of further and further out of her reach, is that she had had breast cancer and she was really worried that she was gonna die before he did and that there wasn't gonna be the resources mm. that it was gonna take to sort of keep him comfortable, keep protect, again, protect his dignity. Um, and, uh, it, you know, so she, on the one hand, she had the personal heartbreak, um, she, and I, I, I go into quite a bit of that in the book. Um, and she also has a lot of very, very practical things that she has to deal with. And as I said earlier, she is also wanting to make sure that his legacy is what he would have wanted it to be. Uh, let's take quick last, yes, if you wanna stand up, um, because we really literally only have 90 seconds, so make um, it fast, make it fast. It seems at the end that Patty, the daughter, and Nancy kind of reconciled a little bit, and I'm wondering if you could okay. say that. Did, they did, did, did Patty, the daughter, and Nancy reconcile at the end? Um, they. They do, although it will forever be sort of rocky. Um, she's, uh, all of her relationships with her children were difficult. One thing that was sort of awful at the end was with Michael. Um, she and he were on such bad terms that she did not want him in the house unless the Secret Service was present. Dear me, that's grim. Well, please thank Karen Tumblebee, and I hope you will enjoy her book. Thank you. I'm sorry to end on such a downer note.